It's like, there we go. Okay. You got it now, Rabbi. Perfect. All right. I should be able to enhance that. Okay. So there we are. All right. Slide three. Elon, my guardian. Thank you. <laughs> always a pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> and always needed, apparently. Um, so while the state of Israel was established, the remaining territories, including pre-48 Palestine, the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, Gaza Strip, were administered from 48 until 67 by Jordan and Egypt, respectively. And bear in mind why that what was the boundary there? The Six Day War in 1967, um, where Israel was attacked. Uh, there was contact between Israel and Jordan at that time, King Hussein. They told him, We don't have an argument with you, stay out of this. At the last, he under pressure uh, towards the end of the Six Day War, he came in. They lost Jerusalem and the West Bank. And that brings us to, you know, sort of where we are now. Uh, now, how did there come to be this idea of the state of Israel? Well, you have the Zionist movement, and if I can change this a little bit, make that a little smaller, so you can actually see the slide, perhaps. Are you seeing the whole slide or not? Yes. Okay. I unfortunately am not. So I'm going to Cut down on one. Okay, there we go. All right. So the Balfour Declaration, uh, understand that at the end of World War, in, in World War I, England fighting against the Ottoman Empire and the Allies and the, and, and the other side wound up controlling the territory of Palestine. We'll see a map eventually. But in 1917, in the middle of the war, apparently trying to um, garner favor with allies, Lord Balfour sent a letter on behalf of the government to Lord Rothschild. And here's the essence. I have much pleasure in conveying to you on behalf of his majesty's government, the following declaration of sympathy with Jewish Zionist aspirations, which has been submitted to and approved by the cabinet. Um, His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine, remember that's the Roman name, of a national home for the Jewish people, and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. It being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. I would be grateful to bring this declaration to the knowledge of the Zionist Federation, yours, Arthur James Balfour. Now, this was obviously done at a time when there was still a colonial essence, if you will, going on in the world. And it was after World War I that in reality, Jordan becomes a country that Lebanon becomes a country, Syria gets carved up a little bit, the French, um, and I forget who it was, representative, said it was the first time he had created a whole country talking about Syria or Lebanon with the stroke of a, of a pencil on a map. Um, so we, uh, there we go, let's get rid of that. Mm. Okay. So let's go to the next slide. Should be able to. All right, next slide. Okay, so speaking of Jordan, the full name of the Kingdom of Jordan was the Royal Hashemite Kingdom of Transjordan. And that meant that the Hashemi tribe, in part, was ruling over that area, which was Transjordan, trans meaning across that portion of Palestine that was east of the Jordan River. So when the Balfour Declaration was given, it talked about the whole of that area. And instead, England, who was in charge, cut off, as it says, 
The British after World War I cut off that part of the territory of Palestine on the eastern side of the river, that's how it became trans, and created what was then an emirate. Abdullah I was the emir, who later became the first king, and he was followed to the throne by his grandson, Hussein. Notice, please, that Abdullah was born in Mecca, Saudi Arabia. Uh, and he was the ruler of Jordan from April 11th, 1921, until his assassination in 1951. And I may be getting a little ahead of the game. Does the reason he was assassinated, and we'll get we'll get to that, uh, was that he wanted to make peace with Israel. He was the Emir of Transjordan, a British protectorate, until the 25th of May in 1946, after which he became the king of an independent Jordan. His father was a ruler of Hejaz, a section of the Arabian Peninsula. And Abdullah, before he was moved up and made Emir, seemed to have pretensions overall to the family throne. And as a favor to the main section of what we would consider the Saudi royal family now, he was moved up to Amman, Jordan, and mockingly, the British said, given a kingdom of sand to rule over. And I want you to understand that in Jordan, he was a Bedouin who became a ruler over the people who had been living in that territory. And the demographics are Jordan is 33% Bedouin ruling class and 67% quote unquote Palestinian um, people that were living there, if you will. And let me just check this. Um, I need to know there's there's a yeah as far as I know my sound should be fine I'm trying to speak loudly let me see what I can do about turning up my volume that's about as loud as I can go okay um So in 1948, when Jordan captured the West Bank, then Abdallah was elevated to the role of Sharif, a guardian of a holy site that gave him real status in the world of Islam. And, and he had the Temple Mount, the third holiest site. It is a holy site in Islam because in their belief, Muhammad traveled on a winged horse, a winged horse to the Temple Mount and then from there ascended to heaven when he died. In the Dome of the Rock on the Temple Mount, there is a wooden little compartment and like a Catholic church with a relic, they have something left over from Muhammad rather than one of the saints. And it is three hairs from the beard of Muhammad, which makes it really a very sacred kind of thing. And from 1948 to 1967, there was a newspaper published by Jordan and the masthead called Jordan the Holy Land because it had dominion, if you will, over the Temple Mount. And that was what Abdallah wanted, was a sense of authenticity in the Muslim world. He had that. He didn't need anything else from Israel. And historically, he actually, behind the scenes, welcomed the Jews returning to the Holy Land what we would call the Holy Land, the land of Israel. Okay. Next. Okay. This is, a, this is the picture of Palestine under the British mandate. So 1923 to 1948. And you see the, this color here, Saudi Arabia. So when you stand in Elat, you can see Egypt over here. You can see Jordan over here. Aqaba is right next to it. And over here is Saudi Arabia, down here in the Arabian Peninsula. Sinai Peninsula heading down this way. And this is what it looked like. And this purple line, it's probably, I don't know if you can read the, the writings or not. This purple line is what the Zionist movement was hoping to get 
ultimately when Israel was going to be declared a state, the Jewish homeland. By the way, there was also a move at that time to found a Jewish homeland in a place where nobody would object. And that place was Uganda, where Antebi is, just for a little bit of irony there. Here's Gaza. This little area right here, Jerusalem here, Tel Aviv, Jaffa, Haifa, the Golan Heights, up in this little area. Here's where I believe you would find Matua, where last May, uh, I was leading a very small group and we had dinner surrounded on three sides by Lebanon and we could wave to Hezbollah. Uh, that area has been evacuated. The people we had dinner with are safe, but they've been evacuated from their home. And this is the United Nations partition plan. The blue areas are what was going to be the Jewish homeland and state. The, the pinkish areas are what was going to be the Arab sections. Now, how this was going to be feasible is kind of hard to imagine. Each side in this conflict or division was going to have three areas that were separated from each other. So there was no contiguous uh, land mass for either the Jews or the Muslims or the Jews or the Palestinians, however you want to refer to them. And so there had to be some way to get from up here in the north to here or to here for the those that were the Palestinians. And if you were Jew, well, we got all of the, the Negev desert pretty much and up to here but then there was this narrow strip of coast and over here, how are you going to get in between? And by the way, please notice this little patch of yellow. That is Jerusalem, which was supposed to be a neutral international city that was going to be administered by the United Nations. Uh, what happened to this peace plan? What happened to the partition? The Jewish side accepted the partition. The Arab side responded by attacking Israel. And what came about later, out of that, came the 1948 borders uh, and the, quote, Green Line, um, which was just simply a ceasefire line. Think about the following. Think in your own mind about how many... Um, how many wars has Israel fought? And the answer may surprise you. Just one. In reality, just one. Because up until 1967, from 48, I'm sorry, 19, whatever it was, when probably 79, around that era, when the Camp David Accords came in and there was peace with Egypt, there had never been a peace treaty between an Arab country and a uh in, in israel when i lived in jerusalem in 1980 to 81 for my first year in rabbinic school if friends wanted to send us something from the states care packages of m m's and aluminum foil and and decent toilet paper in those days they could not insure the package because the u.s post office said to them we cannot give you insurance on packages going into a war zone Although it seemed that there was peace at that time, it was still a war zone. And to this day, Israel has true peace agreements with Egypt and Jordan. Not with Lebanon, not with Syria, not with Iraq, not with Saudi Arabia. None of the, none of the countries that attacked Israel at her founding, other than Egypt and Jordan, have made peace with her. Officially, there's still a state of war. There is a ceasefire. But that's not the same as a peace treaty, right? If you think about where the United States was, well, let's, let's, let's bring it a little closer. Where the United States is today with Vietnam. I traveled to Vietnam recently, a few years ago, and there is peace between our countries because we signed a peace treaty. Uh, there's peace between the U.S. 
and Germany from World War II because we signed peace treaties, right? Israel is not that fortunate with her neighbors. So, all right. Now, you, you saw what the Balfour Declaration had said about the, the status here. And this is the declaration of the state of Israel. And I think it's important. We can offline discuss whether or not Israel is actually living up to this. Um, and I think that would be a lively discussion. But here is what the founding of the state of Israel is supposed to be based on. And by the way, Israel does not have a constitution. So this is basically it. We declare that with, with effect from the moment of the termination of the mandate, that's the British mandate tonight, on the eve of Shabbat, the 6th of the year, 5,708, corresponding to the 15th of May, 1948, until the establishment of the elected regular authorities of the state in accordance with the Constitution, which shall be adopted by the elected constituent assembly, not later than the 1st of October, 1948, the People's Council shall act as provisional council of state and its executive organ, the People's Administration, shall be the provisional government of the Jewish state to be called Israel. What happened to the Constitution? That elected constituent assembly is called the Knesset to this day. And when they gathered in what was supposed to be a constitutional convention, they could not agree. The only thing they could agree to was to meet again the following year which they have done ever since. The state of Israel will be open for Jewish immigration and for the ingathering of the exiles. Remember, this is post-Holocaust. It will foster the development of the country for the benefit of all of its inhabitants. It will be based on freedom, justice, and peace as envisioned by the prophets of Israel. It will ensure complete equality of social and political rights to all its inhabitants irrespective of religion, race or sex. It will guarantee freedom of religion, conscience, language, education, and culture. It will safeguard the holy places of all religions, and it will be faithful to the principles of the Charter of the United Nations. The State of Israel is prepared to cooperate with the agencies and representatives of the United Nations in implementing the resolution of the General Assembly of the 29th November, 1947, it will take steps to bring about economic union of the whole of Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel. We appeal to the United Nations to assist the Jewish people in building up, in the building up of its state and to receive the state of Israel into the comity of nations. We appeal in the very midst of the onslaught launched against us now for months to the Arab inhabitants of the state of Israel to preserve peace. Um, well, uh, preserve peace and participate in the upbuilding of the state on the basis of full and equal citizenship and due representation in all its provisional and permanent institutions. That is why, by the way, you can you, there are Palestinian or not, let me call them not Palestinian, Muslim or Arab citizens of the state of Israel who serve in the Knesset and on the Supreme Court of the state of Israel. We extend our hand to all neighboring states and their peoples in an offer of peace and good neighborliness and appeal to them to establish bonds of cooperation and mutual help with the sovereign Jewish people settled in its own land. The state of Israel is prepared to do its share in a common effort for the advancement of the entire Middle East. We appeal to the Jewish people throughout the diaspora to rally round the Jews of Eretz Yisrael and the tasks of immigration and upbuilding and to stand by them in the great struggle for the realization of the age-old dream, the redemption of Israel. Placing our trust in the Almighty, we affix our signatures to this proclamation at this session of the Provisional Council of State on the soul of the homeland, soil of the homeland, in the city of Tel Aviv on this Sabbath Eve, May 14th, 1948. Anybody want to uh, make a comment at this point?
Not seeing anything in the chat at the moment. Um, no one's talking. So question. Yes, what's the question? So so why didn't they establish a constitution? Roz, the best I can tell you is two Jews, three views. I I I don't have a good answer for that. It just seems to be who we are. Um there, there are lots of, I suppose, pieces to that puzzle. Um and as a, as a backdrop, understand that we are part of a Reformed congregation. Those of us who are associated with Temple Bethel. Um, and in the early days of Reform, it was actually an anti-Zionist movement. So when Israel was being founded as, quote unquote, a Jewish state, issues of religion were handed to the Orthodox because they were the only ones there. Um, and that has led to some of the the other modern issues uh, where we are. And that's um, a little different than your question, but it just shows a bit of what's going on. Um, where does it say that Israel is a Jewish state? Um, in, the, in the declaration, it didn't, did it? But it talked about Jews returning to their homeland and, and the ingathering of exiles. So, what I will tell you is that in terms of Judaism, on my first trip to Israel with David Lieb, Allah Pa Shalom, we saw a sign in Me'a Sha'arim, the, the Orthodox portion of Jerusalem at that time. And it said, Judaism and Zionism are diametrically opposed. In traditional Judaism, the Jews were not supposed to be ingathered to the land of Israel until the Messiah came. Zionism was a break with that tradition, and they said, we're not waiting for the Messiah, we're going now. And so the intent was uh, that it would be a place for Jews to be able to practice their Judaism and to live according to a Jewish rhythm. I think it's uh, perhaps more implicit than explicit, and I'm afraid that for tonight that's the best answer that I can give you. Uh, I have a question, Rabbi. Yes. Um, one of the sticking points is, in, in all of the sticking points, is that um, the Jews drove the, the Palestinians, or whatever you want to call them, out of Israel, out of the land in 48. They were forced to leave. And that's not what I read in the, in the um, declaration, where they seem to appeal to the, to the Arab residents of the, of the land yes. to work with them. Yeah, and Jessica, I think you have to also see that against the backdrop of the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem telling the Arab residents of the area, the entire area, to leave because the Arab armies were going to, in three days, drive the Jews into the sea, and those people who left would be able to come back and take over the land and the houses and the belongings of the Jews that were driven into the sea. So there, there's, um, it, it's not as clear cut. The, the, there were, I think it's safe to say, um, probably some atrocities on both sides. I think that people left when there's a war, people tend to leave if they can get out and become refugees. Those who stayed, and now represent, I believe it's about 15% or 20 of the population of Israel were granted full Israeli citizenship. And the refugees were, were refugees. Um, and I, I would not, I'm not willing to say that Israel drove them all out. I don't believe that that's accurate. I'm also not willing to say that um, they wouldn't have been in danger because there was a war going on. And as was demonstrated recently, when a rocket landed in the area of Abu Ghosh, a suburb of Jerusalem, it killed um, a Muslim resident of Israel, um, an 18-year-old. And it's very tragic and was killed by a rocket sent over from Hamas from Gaza. 
I mean, th th these these issues are um, sometimes the best I can say is not clean. I think it's a, in part a question of looking at um, what is the what's the majority thing. Um, um, and so, and Jessica, you're suggesting that folks become familiar with the Dare Yassin 1948 quote massacre if they want to have informed discussions. I would also suggest you look at other histories of Israel, which talk about how some of the, the Arab residents dressed up as women and infiltrated Jewish areas and attacked them as well. There was a war going on. And, you know, um, when I visited Vietnam, we had a guy that asked him where he was from. Uh, he said, we were in Saigon. He said, I'm not from around here. I said, where, he said, from a little village. I said, what's the name of the village? He said, uh, Mi Lai. That sent a real shiver down my spine, knowing what went on in the Vietnam War in Mi Lai. So it, it's not an excuse. It's simply a statement that terrible things happen when there is a war, uh, as is going on right now on both sides of the border. Um, let's be clear. There was a question about who owns the West Bank and who should have control of it. And here we are. From 1948 to 1967, Jordan controlled the West Bank. Again, they took it over in the, the quote-unquote War of Independence. Um, and they controlled the West Bank, East Jerusalem, where the U.S. Consulate for Jerusalem is still located, and the Old City of Jerusalem. After the expulsion of the Jews from the Old City in 1948, the Jordanians blew up the Maimonides Synagogue as a symbol that the Jews no longer belonged there and wouldn't come back. That, by the way, has been reconstructed uh, in the last six years or so, I believe. In 1967, the Six-Day War, Israel took over all of Jerusalem and the West Bank. Moshe Dayan set up a compromise, which left the Temple Mount under the control of the WAQF, a Muslim consortium committee. But ownership of everything around it is in the hands of Israel. On July 31st of 1988, Jordan, under King Hussein, renounced its claims to the West Bank. With the exception of guardianship over the Muslim and Christian holy sites in Jerusalem, theoretically, it also recognized the Palestine Liberation Organization as the sole legitimate representative of the Palestinian people. Um, and by the way, one wonders how they would feel truly about Hamas at this point, if only the PLO were now the PLA, Palestinian Authority, is the sole legitimate representative. Now, a little bit of evolution of terminology. Following the war in 1948, the refugees were called Arab refugees. Somewhere around the late 50s, 60s, they began to be called the Palestinian refugees. So there's an evolution going on here. Following Black September 1973, the previous terms disappeared from the media and were then replaced with, quote, the Palestinian people. That there's, this is a politically motivated PR campaign to change the perception because in the 50s, there was a comment that the Arab nations would make peace with Israel if Israel would deal with the Arab refugees. And of course, the counter to that was, if they're Arab refugees, why don't you take them in? We took in... Jewish refugees from the Arab world that were expelled from those countries when Israel was founded, including Egypt, and Tunisia, and etc. cetera. Okay? Um, and so this is the back and forth that was going on politically around those issues. Um, one of the things that caused me to want to do this class had to do with watching an Arab emissary to um, Great Britain, as I recall, on the news, talk about how the people in Gaza had been under Israeli military, um, he may have said occupation, for 75 years, which was just not true. As you saw earlier, the Egypt had control of the Gaza Strip from 48 to 67. So during that time, that was not Israeli military occupation. And in August of 2005, so 18 years ago, Ariel Sharon, 
then Prime Minister of Israel, ended the military Israeli rule of the Gaza Strip. That left the Palestinian Authority in charge. And I think it was really a hopeful move on his part to allow the Palestinians to establish self-rule there rather than Israeli military government and could become a first step toward a true two-state solution. And well, in 2006, there was a, an election and Hamas won that legislative elections and then assumed administrative control of the, of the Gaza Strip, I'm sorry, and not the West Bank. That's a misprint on my part. In 2007, Hamas led a military victory over Fatah, that's the Palestinian Authority, the secular nationalistic Palestinian party, which had dominated and threw them out of Gaza. And that's when Hamas completely took over the Gaza Strip. Um, but remember, they were originally democratically elected. That mean, and I don't believe that their platform has changed, which called for the destruction of the state of Israel. The question was asked, what happened to the two state solutions? Well, there were at least twice when, when a true basis for a peace agreement was offered. Ehud Barak, when he was prime minister of Israel, based on the Israeli definition of the West Bank, offered to form a Palestinian state initially on 73% of the West Bank. That's 27% less than the Green Line borders and 100% of the Gaza Strip. That was presented at the 2000 Camp David Summit with President Clinton and Yasser Arafat. There was never an agreement, and we know that real negotiations about that never happened. There was, um, and by the way, there was the Times of Israel in June of this year got a hold of some newly released documents that stated that Israel had agreed to give up sovereignty in part of the old city of Jerusalem, not just East Jerusalem, but the old city in the year 2000. And that was also presented under that proposal of Ehud Barak to Yasser Arafat and showed that Israel was willing to accept Palestinian sovereignty in much of the Temple Mount as a basis for the peace talks. And it went nowhere, it was never never acted upon. Later, Ehud Olmert, who had been mayor of Jerusalem and publicly talked about we would never divide Jerusalem, he became prime minister. And in his bid to negotiate the peace accord, a peace accord, and establish a Palestinian state, he proposed a plan to the Palestinians. And the centerpiece of Olmert's detailed proposal is a suggested permanent border, which would be based on an Israeli withdrawal from most of the West Bank, this was presented to Mahmoud Abbas, also known as Abu Mazen, a complete peace plan with a division of Jerusalem. And it went nowhere. Which brings us to where we've been and are. And I'm going to get rid of this and come back to the Zoom if I can. Where am I? Stop to share. Okay, here we are. And at this point then, I'm going to throw the, the, the session open for questions. Have I, have I so uh, innervated you that nobody has a question? I have another one. Please, Jessica. I, I don't understand why there are um, refugee camps in Gaza and in Jordan and in Lebanon containing, I guess, the descendants of people who fled in 1948. I don't understand why they were not integrated or, or welcomed or accepted into those various areas. Because they were more... I my take on it um, is because they were more valued as political pawns than they were as human beings. Um, it is, is my take. 
had they been integrated into the societies and the other countries, there would have been nothing to keep those countries from making real peace with Israel. Um, and I'm, I, I think of the last real war um, with Gaza, if you will, where the leader of Hamas was sitting in Damascus, Syria, nice and safe, and made the statement that they would continue to fight until every um, Palestinian in Gaza Strip was dead. And at the time, I thought, well, that's easy for him to say. He's not there. And there, if you, if the purpose of a government is in part to protect its citizens um, and allow them to flourish, um, diverting resources to tunnels and weaponry rather than feeding the people and trying to have have them have economic opportunity to me is the exact opposite of that. Now, I know I'm making a somewhat political statement, um, but when you ask that question, that's the only explanation that I have. Now, in the case of Egypt, um, Egypt is not a wealthy country. And in some ways, the last thing that Egypt needs is more people. So if you ask why Egypt didn't take them in and integrate them, it wasn't just the political thing, there was the economic reality. How are they gonna feed them and so forth? And, um, but yet they maintained military control over the people in Gaza and kept them in Gaza as separate from Egyptian citizens. Hamas, by the way, is an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood which is dedicated to taking down the government of Egypt. And that's one reason why Egypt now is reluctant to let people from Gaza into, its, into the mainstream of Egyptian life. How are they going to feed them? How are they going to house them? And they don't, they're, I was going to say they don't trust them. Let me just say they're too afraid that Hamas will slip agents in and begin to start cells of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. Also, to take them into that area of the Sinai, where it's already a fairly lawless land, and where there are problems with um, people setting up their own little fiefdoms uh, for drug smuggling, weapon smuggling, uh, and in general resistance to Egyptian rule, uh, Egypt is not anxious at all to bring more people in that could add to that. And historically, um, it, it goes back to that thing of they were Arab refugees and the Israeli side said, why don't you take them in? We've taken in the Jews who are refugees. Um, it's just a different approach to it. And I suppose you would have to ask somebody from one of those countries to get um, uh, a differing view and, and some rationalization for why they did that. It was never an Israeli state, but the is not the way. Uh, Rabbi, I have another question. Yes. Uh, oh, who exactly are the people who comprise Hamas and Hezbollah? Are they tr descendants of those Palestinians or the Arabic people that left Israel when it was first created in 1948? Or is this the current destination of all the people who were in Al Qaeda and ISIS and Syria? Who are they? Um, in theory, they are, in theory, and I can't tell you that I'm completely accurate here, they are uh, descendants of the original refugees. But um, you also have to understand that they're being supported by Iran. I find that somewhat ironic because as far as I know, they are Sunni Muslims and the and the Iranians are Shias, and they're not friendly. That's one reason why Saudi Arabia was interested in making some peace with Israel, because the Saudis are firmly Sunni Muslims, and Iran is Shia. To give you a sense of what that can come down to, a few years ago, when I was happily in retirement, and being the rabbi on cruise ships from time to time, we actually were in Morocco. We had a wonderful guide and she was busy explaining 
how friendly and open a, a society Morocco is and how the king of Morocco has uh, a fond affiliation with Israel and so forth. And the Jews are welcome there. By the way, that's where Maimonides was for a while. Um, and so I asked her the question because I asked her about the Jewish community in Morocco and they're free to have synagogues and pray and they have freedom of religion. I said, what if a, a, a Shia Muslim came into Morocco, how would they be treated? And this is what she said. They're welcome to come here. They're welcome to attend services in our mosques. But if they start to preach their heresies, we're going to put them in jail. So there are deep divisions in the world of Islam, as there are many times deep divisions in the Jewish world. Um, two Jews, three views. We try not to uh, put each other into into jail, but Sue, Reese, you have your hand up. Right. You're muted, Sue. There you are. Can Hamas be voted out? Do or and do they get voted every year? Um, how, how does that work? There's not been an election since 2006 in the Gaza Strip, and what it would take. Uh, on the part of the Palestinians would be an armed uprising, a revolution against Hamas, which they have been unwilling to do. And I, I, I have some sympathy for them in that. On the other hand, um, on the other hand. Right, the, because but, they keep saying, they keep saying, you know, we don't want Hamas, we don't like Hamas, but yet uh, but there's been no election, but so they'd have to fight to get an election, is what you're saying. Yes, that's what that's what it would take. And the the current incursion of of Israel is, in theory, and I hope they have a good exit strategy, is to result in regime change to eliminate Hamas, and I assume to put the Palestinian Authority into place there, unless there's a one of a better word, an indigenous um, political movement in Gaza that could take over and begin to govern. Um, but uh, I, I think I, I recommend highly to you all to read articles by Thomas Friedman in the New York Times and lately one by Brett Stevens, I believe his name is, uh, about what's going on in Israel and some of the reporting that goes on. There's been reported that an Israeli missile strike hit the hospital in Gaza and killed 800 people, as I recall. Um, and this was reported by Hamas. Uh, what you don't see a lot of is the fact that there was an intercepted cell phone call between two Hamas operatives who said it's clear that this was not an Israeli strike, it was a missile strike from their side. By the way, it did not hit the hospital. It hit the parking lot. That doesn't mean it didn't do damage, but it was not directed, whatever it was, was not directed by Israel at the hospital. And there weren't 800 people that were killed because there's a tendency to inflate the, uh, the casualty numbers on that side. Um, but be that as it may, a lot of lives were lost in an act of war, regardless of which side it came from, whether it was friendly fire or from the Israeli side, people died. And there is an ongoing tragedy. I don't want to minimize that. I'm not saying I, I want to recognize the humanity of the of the people who are dying and, and be aware of the sorrow that inflicts. Um, and in war, that's what happens. You are you you get into an I it relationship rather than an I thou relationship, and it's it's painful and it's awful, and that's one reason why it's been said that 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 some of the reporters and 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 Jews as well are trying to hold on to two very different ideas. One is our own grief and sorrow and anger over what happened with 1,400 people being slaughtered and, and taken as, and 200 and some being taken as hostages. 
The Iranian foreign minister today in an interview said they would be released if Israel just stops. If they stop the bombardments, Hamas will release them. But, he said, Israel has to also release the 6,000 prisoners, Palestinian prisoners, that are in her jails. I thought, well, that's not at all the same thing. Those prisoners are not hostages. They were found guilty of offenses versus civilians, grandmothers, children, who were taken as hostages to be human shields. And so there's not an equivalency here. But we're trying to hold on to that and not lose the humanity of those who are being killed. When you see a little girl being pulled out of the rubble in Gaza, that should make your heart ache. If, if it doesn't, I don't know why. I know there is a lot of rage in Israel over the hostages, over the people that were killed, and so forth. But I also think there's a danger of becoming that which you're fighting against. And I think we have to, we have to maintain some sense of the overall tragedy of this. Um, or we don't live up to what Jewish tradition would teach us. Sharon, you have your hand up. Sharon, you're still muted. There we go. Please clarify, clarify for me, Rabbi. I can't figure out the difference between Hamas and Palestinians. Um, I'm, I'm fond of, of quoting something that, that existed a number of years ago. Um, Yasser Arafat was considered a Palestinian. He was born in Egypt, which I would have thought would have made him an Egyptian. Ariel Sharon was born in the territory of Palestine, which theoretically would make him a Palestinian, but he's an Israeli. Um, there is a different definition. For those of us who are Jews, we have the right of return to go to Israel and live there and become citizens. But I lived there for a year. I consider Jerusalem to be spiritually and in my heart, my home, but I'm an American. I'm not an Israeli. Um, and on the other hand, if you are of Palestinian descent and you're born in America, it, there was a point where people born in England, let me put it that way, 10, 15 years ago, who were of Palestinian descent were considered Palestinians, not people in England who were Muslims and of Palestinian descent, but literally, literally Palestinians. So there's a, there's a question of how you define who they are. And I think they're entitled to define themselves as they choose. But let's put it this way. Palestinian is a nationality, if you will. Hamas is a political movement with a platform of armed resistance to Israel and the destruction of the state of Israel. And has been, as has been put on buildings and college campuses in this country, they want to free Palestine from the river, meaning the Jordan River, all the way to the Mediterranean, which means they want the complete destruction of the state of Israel. So when you talk about Islamic Jihad, when you talk about Hamas, when you talk about the Palestinian Authority, these are political movements or political organizations, or in some cases, governments of sorts. Whereas Palestinian is, again, I would say, a nationality, an ethnicity, if you will. Does that help, Sharon? Could I say that all Hamas members are Palestinians, but all Palestinians do not belong to Hamas? That's absolutely true from the all Palestinians don't belong to Hamas. For instance, the, the interesting tension, if you will, that exists now between the West Bank and Gaza is the fact that the West Bank, the, the uh, administration there is the Palestinian Authority. And they view um, Hamas really as an enemy because Hamas threw them out of Gaza. They're opponents. Um, whether or not every member of Hamas is a Palestinian, 
I don't know. I don't have their ID cards. I would say the major certainly the vast majority are. Could there be people from other countries who have joined Hamas? It's possible, uh, but I think it is it is clearly majority Palestinian. So if you want to say that all all Palestinians are not part of Hamas, that's absolutely true, and certainly the vast vast majority of people in Hamas are in fact Palestinian and fighting for what they would call Palestinian liberation. The Palestinian Authority are opposed to Hamas? Yes, they are political opponents. Ideally, the analogy would be Republicans and Democrats, but far more violent and in, in an armed conflict with each other. It was a coup d'etat, if you will, or a revolution that that sent Fatah, that that um, political wing of the Palestinian Authority, out of Gaza. Okay. Uh, let me go to Kim Wade, and then I'll get back to you, Mary Lou. Okay, thank you, Kim. This is Robin uh, and Kim. Uh, oh, and okay. Just wondering, uh, we put a question in the chat. What were the Palestinian concerns about the proposed peace agreements that caused them not to accept them? Um, I'll give you two, okay? There is a very unfortunate history in the Middle East, modern Middle East. If you try to make peace, you get assassinated. I want you to think of Anwar Sadat in Egypt, who was assassinated for having made peace with Israel. Think of Yitzhak Rabin, who was assassinated by a Jew who didn't want him to continue down the path of peace that he was trying to find. Think about King Abdullah I of Jordan who was assassinated because he was going to make peace with Israel. So there's that, that part. I think Mahmoud Abbas was convinced that if he made peace with Israel, he would go down that road and be assassinated. Yasser Arafat was committed to the revolution and it's a lot easier, I'm fond of saying, to be a revolutionary than it is to rule and make sure the streets are paved, the garbage is picked up, the mail is delivered, um, etc. cetera. It, it's a much more difficult thing. In fact, I didn't put this in the slides. King Hussein of Jordan offered Yasser Arafat the prime ministership of Jordan, which would have thereby made Jordan the de facto Palestinian homeland and Arafat turned it down. That led to, quote, Black September when there was a civil war in Jordan and the Jordanians kicked out that part of the Palestinian population and they went to Lebanon. That speaks for itself. Um, Mary Lou, you had a question? And yeah. then, I'll, then I'll get to you. And all I see is Blint's life as your ID. I see your hand is up, but <laughs> Mary Lou. I understand that the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank is very weak. And I gather the Palestinian Authority in Gaza was weak, and that's how um, Hamas was able to take, win the election, or else it was a dirty election. I mean, we've heard about some of those. Um, wouldn't it be before the settlements, wouldn't it have been in Israel's interest to help the Palestinian Authority develop strength so it could rule in a positive way? Yes. The, the simple answer is yes. The, the, more, the more complicated piece to that is um, one of the reasons that Hamas won the election was because the Palestinian Authority has been... Um, known to be corrupt. Um, there is, I don't think it's just an urban legend that Yasser Arafat kept a briefcase with several hundred thousand dollars of cash. And when somebody came to him and complained about what he was doing or what was going on, he simply gave them money. In the Middle East, that's known as bakshish, and you follow the money. Um, in fact, um, the reason we have peace with Jordan and Israel is because the United States paid for it. We canceled $700 million of debt that Jordan had to the US. Um, 
And we're still paying for the peace between Egypt and Israel because Egypt's foreign aid, according to the Camp David Accords, uh, is based on a percentage of what Israel gets of foreign aid. So Egypt doesn't have to lobby the US for money, foreign aid, because Israel does for itself and Egypt gets a percentage of that or based on a percentage of that. Um, yes, um, but the, um, you also have to remember when, we, when, you, when you talk about strengthening the, um, the Palestinian Authority, they, they still have the practice of if somebody uh, associated with them commits a terrorist act and is killed or jailed, the Palestinian Authority gives the family money. That's a practice that goes on to this day. And it's, it's hard to think about strengthening people who do that. Um, it's as things are. All right, Ms. Blintzlife. <laughs> Hi, it's Stephanie. Hi, Stephanie. Uh, a mere month ago, Saudi Arabia was ready to sign an agreement recognizing, accepting Israel. Do you think that has something to do with what started this whole war? Um, yeah, I do. Um, particularly since Saudi Arabia was looking to counter the strength of Iran. Again, Sunni versus Shia. Um, and Iran saw this as a great threat to their ability to control the narrative and what was going on. And um, although that agreement was going to require Israel to make some concessions to the Palestinians, I think that Hamas saw this as a great threat to their status as well. Um, I can't tell you where things are now, but my perception, and let me, let me be very clear, my perception was that the rest of the Arab world was getting tired of the Palestinian cause. And when they saw um, some of the benefits of the Abrahamic Accords and so forth, which were done, if you will, leaving the, the, the Palestinians behind. When you're offered a chance for peace and you turn it down, you're offered a chance for peace and you turn it down, um, Eventually, I think, the, the people who are supporting you are going to say, you know, you have to be reasonable. Um, if anybody has been through a divorce or knows someone who's been through a divorce, <laughs> one of the keys to having a, uh, I would say, a uh, civilized divorce, if you will, an amicable divorce, has to do with not making extraordinary demands on your partner, but coming to um, a valid agreement for both. Does that mean that that either side gets exactly what they want? No, it's the opposite. Uh, the perfect compromise winds up sometimes where nobody gets what they want because everybody gave up something. And if you're not willing to compromise, um, where are you going to wind up? And, and I say that as somebody who, as you may know, uh, went through a divorce with somebody who was a, a very good person, namely my ex and unfortunately now late wife, Ellen. Um, and we had a remarkably um, amicable divorce because we chose to do that. We worked at it. Um, it's unfortunate that um, more people can't take that path. Um, so putting Saudi Arabia aside, do you think that they chose the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War specifically? I, I want to know what was the flashpoint. Um, I, I think there were two. One is they've been planning this apparently for two years. And you practice and you practice and you get ready and then eventually... You, you have to put into practice what you've been doing. Um, there's been a report that keeping the Israeli troops at the Gaza border, not making an incursion to Gaza now, is going to is going to demoralize the military. Um, you you come to a point where you have to do something, and I think the 50th anniversary 
was uh, a, a very convenient um, date as a, as a target. Can I tell you for sure what was in the minds of Hamas? No. I do know that based on the armaments that these, the Israeli army has recovered, they actually planned that their people would stay on Israeli territory for a long time and continue to fight in Israeli territory. So it didn't go the way they, they thought it would. Um, and the other thing is, um, it, it, we you know the question has come up, would there be an election? Could there be an election? Do the majority of Palestinians really want Hamas as their government at this point? And the answer being no, if, if Hamas's promise to the masses was, we're going to set you free and we're going to get rid of the Israelis, Sooner or later, you have to begin to back up that, not exactly campaign promise, but that statement. Mm -hmm. I think you, you just get to a critical point, a boiling point, uh, maybe in modern parlance, an inflection point, where you, you have to put some action to what you're saying. Now, that's me. I'm sitting here safe and relatively safe and sound, far away, looking at it and trying to piece the... the uh, connect the dots, if you will. Um, I don't know for sure. And, and, and I, I have no inside information about that. So I want to be clear uh, what I know and what I don't know, what's opinion, what seems to fit. But having made the statement about the, uh, the Amazon driver in my parking, you know, in my driveway and seeing everything and then piecing it together and getting it wrong, uh, I could be in that place too. So um, I ask you all to turn your brains on and evaluate, you know, what you think, if it makes sense to you and, and it seems uh, to be supported by the facts, then yes. What we do know are, is that it was the 50th anniversary. Um, and I think in some ways it was a long time coming. Uh, Thank you. And you're showing up as Kim Wade, I guess it's Kim and was it Robin? Yes, that's right. Yes. So we had a, a question about, or I have a question about, do you think that the current approach that Israel is taking with the uh, constant bar bombing of Gaza with its civ uh, civilian death toll being quite high is the right approach? Forgive me, Robin, I'm going to say, I don't think I'm in a position to say whether it's right or wrong. Um, what I will say is, it's awful. Um, I, I do question it. Again, I refer you to Thomas Friedman, who's uh, really erudite on this subject. He feels that Israel is uh, coming into a trap. I think that the incursion into Gaza is going to possibly result in much more anti-Semitism. Um, I, I, I find, in my mind, Israel caught between a rock and a hard place. They, they can't continue. I, I think this, this incursion with the number of people that were killed and the hostages taken has changed the willingness of the Israeli public. And after all, they're the ones who are living there. They're the ones that are still under bombardment with rockets from Gaza. Um, they're the ones that endure. And when we were there in May, there were rockets that came over from Gaza. And there was some shelling the week before we were in Matula from Lebanon. So they're the ones living under this. It's really up to them. But they, they can't keep doing the wash, rinse, repeat, if you will, sort of thing um, over and over again. The 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 policy of what they call mowing the lawn or trimming the weeds or whatever it was at this point just doesn't work. And they have to do something. Is this the right thing? Um, I don't know. I, I, I can't give you, it's absolutely right. Um, does that make it wrong? I'm reluctant to go there. But as I said, they need to have a really good exit strategy, and I'm not sure there is one. Um, the 
the defense minister of Israel told the country today that he thought this was going to be a conflict that could go on for months. How that can be good for anybody, I don't understand. It's Israel is not a huge country. You have all these troops mobilized, which means they're, that reservists have been taken away from their jobs. It's affecting the economy. The question was asked today, I saw, how is Israel going to pay for this? Um, I would, I'd rather see a peaceful solution. Now, Abba Ibn, foreign minister of Israel years ago, the late Abba Ibn, talked about you don't sit down to make peace with a friend. You're only going to sit down to make peace with an enemy. You're only going to you're only going to have negotiations and compromise. You can, you're only going to do that with people with whom you don't agree. Um, is there a way out of this? And, you know, I, I, I have to feel that something good will come out of this. I want to, um, and I don't know that it's a great analogy, but the peace with Egypt, which came only after the Yom Kippur War. I don't know if you've been to Egypt. If you go to Cairo, there's a bridge across the Nile River. And at the end of that bridge, there are some really heroic lion statues. And there's an inscription, and it says that the bridge and the lions are dedicated to the glorious victory of the Egyptian army over Israel in 1973. Now, at the end of that war, not one square centimeter of land had changed hands. Everything was as it was. But Egypt claimed it as a victory because in Islam, you're not supposed to make peace from a place of weakness, but from a place of strength. And that was why, our, that was why Sadat could make peace because he first claimed a victory and then could sit down and make peace with Israel. Is there something that could possibly come out of this that would satisfy that? I don't know. But if if something better doesn't come out of this, then it's in vain. I, I know that's not a direct answer to your question, Robin, but I just don't have anything better. And I apologize. I wish I, I was more of a genius. I wish I had better insight than I do. But I'm being honest and I'm giving you what I can. No, I understand. I, I was, it just seems to me that something along the lines of special forces operations that are more targeted and less likely to have so much collateral damage would make a lot more sense than, you know, bombing and taking out entire neighborhoods like they're doing now. I, I would, I agree with you. And there's a caveat, which is that to do um, true special forces operations that are that kind of targeted requires the ability to gather the intelligence to know what the target is and where it is. And unfortunately in Gaza, Israel does not have that ability. She does more in the West Bank because people are willing to cooperate there. Hamas roots out people that are cooperating. There was an interesting story about um, a reporter who had worked with somebody who was a translator in Gaza and had helped him uh, with some stories and so forth. And then Hamas came to him and said, knock it off. We know where you live. We know your family. This is not going to end well for you. And so he had to stop um, uh, cooperating with this other reporter. And that's the kind of regime we're dealing with. So I agree with you. I would, I would rather see that, but I don't know how Israel could carry that kind of thing out at this time. And that's, that's the difficulty. Michael, let me get to you. Um, I see the Harrisons are on there. Hi. Um, since we're going over the history of Israel, I just want to ask you about what you know. Um, the term occupation is used a lot. And also in relation to settlements that I guess have it, uh, incurred in the West Bank. And I wanted to know what you knew about that. I've been reading this book called The Yellow Wind from 1987, which um, a reporter in Israel went over to the West Bank. And it just 
appeared that the issue at that time between the two sides, uh, a heavy dose of racism and hatred was building and building. And the book kind of indicated that many of the young children of, the, of that generation, the only thing they knew about is Israelis were the soldiers. They had not met anybody. And so um, it's kind of like when you have two separate peoples in this country, when you segregate people, you don't understand them, you don't want to understand them. And there's like a lot of animosity and hatred between the two groups. That's yeah. kind of what the book said. And so I wanted to know if that was a spark of the first intifada and the second intifada. I just don't know the history of those things. Do you know anything about that? I don't know if that per se is a spark, but certainly if you grow up under military occupation and all you know is the military from the other side, it's not going to give you the warm fuzzies. Um, you, you touched on, an, on a number of... of uh, issues. And I'll give you an analogy. Um, I believe that in interfaith work, you strengthen the overall community. And one of the things that comes out of interfaith work is that it's no longer us and them. It's no longer those Christians or those Muslims and those Jews. It's only us. And that was something I saw that worked out um, remarkably when I was in Santa Fe and, and active and started a, an interfaith coalition, um, the sense of, of companionship, of commonality changed that. And people who, in, in the Lutheran church with which we were very friendly, who got to know us and we them, came to the point where that church would prepare the break the fast for Yom Kippur for us, we would buy them a the wreath for the wreath of the altar on Christmas. We alternated planting trees and Tubishvat between the two places. Um, and there are organizations, uh, Creativity for Peace, which brings young, interestingly, women over Palestinian and Israeli so that they can meet each other and learn their narratives and see the other side and try to become friends. And hopefully in the next generation, they'll know more about each other um, and be able to, to make peace, be willing to make peace and so forth. And so I guess my answer to you is that certainly adds to it. As for the, the settlements, um, it goes back to who owns the West Bank. And, and you know, when you have ultranationalists in the Israeli government, as we do now, and they, they talk about we should annex, quote unquote, the West Bank, or as they call it, Judea and Samaria. And I think it was actually Netanyahu himself who made a comment about, you know, how dare you tell me that Jews can't live in Judea? Um, it's... Um, it's going to become a barrier to peace. And there are those who say that the settlements that they're, they're doing are designed to keep there from ever being a two-state solution. Um, I don't see another way to peace. I just don't, besides having some kind of a two-state solution. And anything that, that, that does that, um, that prevents that, is something I don't look kindly upon, I'll be honest. Um, and I hope that's, I'm trying to keep the, the answer relatively brief. You can talk to me offline later if you want or along the way. Um, but I do want to I move on. I hope that at least gives you a sense of the situation. Michael, Sherman? Michael, you're muted. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So I'm totally pro-Israel all the way i just wanted to, and you used the, the expression a few minutes ago in vain and the idea is that since hamas uh, is a political movement an idea a concept uh brought into action by not all palestinians but the militant you know the bad ones and democracy is also a concept that 
we enjoy in this country and Western nations as well as Israel. Um, how can how can uh, the the military the killing uh, how can they even find the uh, Hamas among the Palestinians? And even if they were able to kill them, the concept of the the bad ones, the Hamas, how can they? Um, How can they wipe out the, the idea, the Hamas's concept of Israel shouldn't exist, exist, and Jews should be killed, and it should all be ours? Isn't it? Isn't maybe the military invasion, as much as I probably am for it or am for it, possibly in the long run in vain? Or have you said so already? Um, I'm not a prophet nor the son of a prophet, so I can't tell you if it will be in vain. Um, okay. When you ask, can they truly wipe out the, let's call it the philosophy or the, the, the political yeah. ideas that Israel should be eliminated? Um, I doubt it. Right. You, you'll never... I can't say you'll never wipe it out um, because if there could be peace and enough peace dividend, people will see the advantage of that versus war. Um, one of the, one of the problems, and I, and I say, I see people sidestep this all the time. There's an interview on NPR today um, with the, the head of um, the United Nations Refugee Agency in Gaza. And he was asked point blank, you know, we see um, missile launchers next to schools and hospitals and apartment buildings that Hamas is running. Um, you know, why aren't you doing something about that? Why aren't you pointing that out? Why aren't you decrying that? And the head of the agency just, just sidestepped it. Mm -hmm. um, and and there, he was asked if it's true, according to Israel, they've cut off fuel supply because they say that Hamas has great stockpiles of fuel. I don't know if that's true or not. Being somebody who supports Israel, I, I want to believe that. Um, and they asked this, you know, the head of this agency, if he had seen any evidence. And he said, I haven't seen any, but basically it wasn't, it was that he hadn't looked for it either. Um, and, and I found that to be rather disconcerting. It's like, Hamas gets a waiver. We, we talk about violations of international law and, and laws of engagement. You're not supposed to use people as human shields. But that's exactly what's going on with the hostages. And it's mm -hmm. exactly what's going on when you, when you put an ammunition dump in a school or a hospital or an apartment building for that matter. You're making that a military target and assuming that the other side won't attack it or hoping that they won't attack it, or if they do, it'll be a really bad, a bad public relations move because civilians will be killed. And, and there was a, an interesting cartoon I posted on Facebook the following statement. If I start a fight, I'm responsible for starting the fight, and I get beat up, who's to blame? And somebody sent me a cartoon and it shows somebody wrapped in a, in a Palestinian flag banging on a hornet's nest in a tree, getting attacked by the hornet's nest. And the hornet's nest, by the way, was wrapped in an Israeli flag. And then in the third panel, that person with the, the uh, Palestinian flag wrapped around them is surrounded by cameras from CNN, Fox, and and I, I forget who else, and pointing, you know, accusingly at, at the hornet's nest. Um, I, I, I don't have a good solution. And my fear is that this will be in vain. And 
if you look at, at what the U.S. did in Afghanistan mm. and, Iraq, and what was spawned out of that, I think it's safe to say nothing good came out of that. And if, I think it's a big if, um, the um, um, if Israel could could get a regime change in Gaza, and one that was willing to not have the destruction of Israel as its goal, mm. and there could be peace, what could be accomplished there would be amazing. That's an awfully big if. And at what price? You know, that's that's always the, the, the question. And again, this is a question for Israeli society. We can look at the, we can look from the sidelines, but they're the ones living with this, and they're the ones that will bear the consequences of this. Now we will too. The fact that we have to have armed guards at the synagogue when we have services. Um, my first Shabbat, I looked out the window of my office, and I saw a police car. Right. And I've used this expression. It's like sweet and sour sauce in Chinese food. I was glad for the security and devastated that we needed it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that's where we are. And I think that what happens there will have consequences for us in this country in terms of backlash, at least for the, the time being. Um, and that's, that's a concern for me. As I say, I wish I had a, um, a, a crystal ball or a clear vision or a, or a flash of genius that come out of this. My fear is that this will all be in vain. Um, years ago, there was a play in Ashland, Oregon at the Shakespeare Festival called North Country. And um, having been the rabbi in Ashland for three years, I took a group from my congregation in Burlingham, California to see the Shakespeare Festival. We saw that, that particular play. Sitting next to me were two Holocaust survivors. It was a play about the white supremacists in the Pacific Northwest. And the play used the technique that Shakespeare used, where you have a, a term, a word that's used multiple times as the play goes on, and each time it gathers more and more meaning. And in this case, the, the, the word was the guy's being interviewed on his front porch. Seems like a decent guy, happens to be white supremacist, and he makes the statement, as long as one Aryan warrior is alive, the war's not over. By the time you've been through a number of scenes in the play, and that gets repeated, and at the end, it's a child of about eight years old holding an assault rifle in front of an, uh, a monument to Adolf Hitler. And he says, as long as there's one Aryan warrior alive, the war's not over. Uh, it is chilling. This was a play where afterwards, because it was so chilling and awful, the cast came out and spoke with the audience to explain, you know, what they were doing was playing a character, it's not them, and, and so forth, and to answer questions. And, and I felt so awful for having taken this Holocaust survival couple to see that play. But also that image has stayed with me. And when we go through something like this, um, this, we don't know what seeds will be planted. We don't know what will come out of this. Will this end the fanaticism? Will it end the, um, the absolute opposition to the state of Israel? Um, I, I don't know. I, I, having lived through the Vietnam War, I didn't serve. Let me be clear. But I remember, I, I, in preparing for this class and, and for what's been going on in the world, I thought of a poster that was very popular back then. There was a tree, very stylized, and the caption on the poster was, war is not healthy for children and other, and other living things. And I, and I found myself back in that age and thinking of that poster and, and wondering 
can something good come out of this? I think this was thrust upon us um, along the way. I think that it was, it should have been possible to negotiate around the other peace plans that were presented along the way. Um, but that's what I think. And again, I'm sitting here and so far nobody has tried to assassinate me. Can't tell you what's gonna to happen tomorrow, but so far so good. And um, that's where we are. I, and it's hard for me to be definitive about any of this. Um, but I do want to keep as much as I can the historical facts as straight as we can. So Helene, is that you? That does you don't look like Helene. <laughs> Mr. Chinovsky, you're mute, you're muted. Okay, can okay. you hear can you you're still muted? There you are. Wait, what about now? You're good. Okay. You know, um you, you talked about the children. That that was and and Mike had a, I thought, made a very good point about not being able to kill an idea. And the reason I'm, what I really wanted to ask you was, in the West, on the West Bank with the Palestinian Authority, the children, the books that the children have are really not very advantageous to loving Israel. And uh, I'm not sure what their ultimate goal is once they get this state, this two-state solution. And when they get it, are they going to be armed? And like, and you know, a child is brought up to think a certain way. You can, you have, they have to be careful, carefully taught to be prejudiced. And when they're getting only those books, that's what they're growing up to be. And even, even in the West, even on Gaza, I hope the Palestinian people, uh, if they're freed from Hamas, would not have would be able to not have that idea to see the end of Israel. But we don't know that. And we don't know, to get back to the two-state solution and the Palestinian Authority, an armed country practically in Israel and dividing Israel, actually, the way it's set up, uh, to me seems quite dangerous. I don't see any solution. You know, I've been writing a book for 30-something years everyone knows about. And in it, I, I started writing about Israel over 30 years ago. It hasn't changed at all. It's up to date. Here's, here's what I would say to you. The, the starting place in, in terms of the two-state solution was that the Palestinian side would be demilitarized because Israel had always said, we cannot, we cannot deal with the possibility of having a terrorist state on our border. And that's understandable. On the other hand, I also, I understand why Part of that, at least, is unacceptable for the Palestinians if they want to be a true state. Um, you know, Switzerland seems to be doing okay with neutrality and not having an army, as far as I know. Although they do supply the guards to the Vatican. <laughs> um, but that becomes part of it. And the peace plans, I didn't get into the details, but the peace plans actually contained uh, the means for which there could be um, communication, if not absolute, con con you know, if they're not going to be contiguous, there would be a path where there'd be free travel between the two sides of the, of the Palestinian state, between Gaza and the West Bank and so forth, um, that they would administer. In, so there were, that was taken into account. Also, the peace plans had the idea that Israel would have freedom of the airspace over the Palestinian state. And when we talk about, can you eradicate an idea? Um, I think what, what it will take is at the end of this, if there is regime change, then much as the world is saying on some level, not loudly enough, I think, that when the Ukraine war is over, Russia is responsible for rebuilding the country. I think it's incumbent upon Israel to rebuild the areas of, of um, Gaza so that the Palestinians have a place to live. If we do that, if after the war we extend a hand of friendship and they're willing to take that hand, 
then it's not us eradicating an idea. That's us showing them that, that there is an alternative that is to their benefit. And that was the idea behind the Oslo Accords and the Camp David Accords, um, that in fact, what would happen is peace would become inevitable because people had seen the alternatives to peace and they would see the advantages to peace and choose peace. Um, and I've known a good number of Palestinians in my travels in Israel where there was not a, a doubt in my mind. If I had been prime minister of Israel and they'd been the leader of the Palestinians, there would have been peace decades ago. And frankly, that includes the driver that we had on our trip to Israel in May, who happened to have been born in East Jerusalem. And so was a Palestinian and a practicing Muslim. As he was driving us around in our van, he had his prayer rug in the back. He brought his son with us sometimes. He made us a meal for lunch. He bought us food to eat while we were overlooking the Temple Mount uh, from the Mount of Olives. On our last uh, couple of days in Jerusalem when it was Arab Shabbat, he bought everyone a rose in our group and personally handed it to them. And our feelings about him, I gave him my home address and my phone number. And I said, if you ever want to come to the States, it would be my honor to have you in my house. And I mean that sincerely. And I don't have his phone number, or believe me, I would have been on the phone to him to find out if he was okay. We have family and friends, as many people do in Israel. Um, I just found out that an old friend of mine from college who happens to be Christian, and her um, current husband, let me say that, um, his son was in Argentina and fell in love with an Israeli girl who happened to be there. He's now in Tel Aviv because he wants to be with her. And so they're now every bit as worried about family in Israel as we are. And those kinds of connections, if you can do it on a friendly basis, if you can put your hand out and there's somebody on the other side to take your hand, which there was with Tahir, our, our driver, we had our lives in his hand as he was driving us around. And I would, I would trust him with my life today. Those are, the, are the, the spots of light and hope that I hope we could evolve um, from the ashes. Am I a Pollyanna? I like to think not. I rarely am accused of being an optimist. Perhaps in this case I am. But I have to affirm the positive. I have to hope that this is something that will ultimately find a blessing in it. My grandmother told me that when God sends you something terrible, there's always a little silver lining somewhere in the dark cloud. And I'm holding on to that with all my life and heart. Mary Lou. Thank you, Rev. You know, piggybacking on what you were just saying about the driver and your establishing the connection with him, um, I'm a supporter of Combatants for Peace. And this book, I don't know if you can see it or not, was written by a man who um, tells the story of a Palestinian and a Jewish man, both of whom, are you familiar with it? I'm not. They both fought, fought in the war and they both lost children to terrorist acts. And they decided that war did not get them the peace. So, but person to person things. So like your experience with the Palestinians and then they go out into various communities and, and encourage the people to recognize the humanity. I am not a Pollyanna. I'm from New York. I'm very cynical, <laughs> but I can't, I've got a hope and yes. I don't have an answer. I don't have an answer. Um, I'm not entirely sure any of us does, which is why I started this with trying to get some facts out that people may have forgotten, or in some cases were being distorted in the press. Um, 
and to look at some of the, the backdrop to all of this. Um, I was about to make a political statement. I'm going to, I'm going to refrain. Arlene, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, I, I guess I had a question following what you just said. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that is, were the initial uh, uh, Israeli Arabs, let's call them that, they weren't all Arabs, the non-Jews who were part of the original 1948 state of Israel, were they and are they as well accepted as any Jew who comes to Israel? And also talking about the current situation, what is the reaction within Israel of uh, the, the Arab, the Palestinian Israelis to their neighbors and to what's going on? And do the Israeli, the Jews, totally trust their uh, neighbors? Could you ask a more difficult question, please? <laughs> um, we have a nephew. And I thought he was living inland. He may be a little closer to Gaza. Um, he does not trust his Arab neighbors. Um, I would say there was a point up until a few years ago, where I think that particularly in Haifa, the Jews and the Arabs lived in pretty good harmony with each other. That got shattered a couple of years ago. Um, and was it came as a great surprise to some of the Jews there. Um, in, in terms of trust, I, I think um, Uh, you know, I, I come back to Abba Ibn, who, who talked about you make a peace treaty with your enemy, you don't have to trust them. You, you sign the treaty and then you verify, verify, verify. So I think as, as time goes on, if there aren't attacks, you begin, you begin to trust. Um, and in terms of acceptance, again, you have Muslims on the Supreme Court. You have um, my first trip to Egypt. Along in the group was... Uh, a civilian in Israel. Uh, I assumed he was a Jew. And he eventually told me he's not Jewish, he's Catholic. And just to prove it, he made the sign of the cross on himself. Um, and, you know, perfectly integrated into the society and so forth. Um, so if you're asking me if, if Israeli society is a society that's free of prejudice, I'm going to tell you no. Not. The Orthodox hate me and they think I'm a destroyer of Judaism. Um, so internally we have that. There are issues, honestly, with the integration of Ethiopian Jews into Israeli society. Um, and that's been going on, even though we've rescued a, a, you know, a lot of them. There was Operation Moses, I think, years ago. Um, and it's, it, it's, it's difficult and they're wonderful people. They, you know, the law of return for Israel was sculpted based on the Nuremberg laws. And that was the definition of who was a Jew in terms of being able to make, to come to Israel and be a citizen. To be registered as a Jew by the, the office of religion or whatever it's called is a different story. But to, be a, but to be a citizen, all you need is one Jewish grandparent to be able to prove that. You can come in. And why did they choose that? Because that's what the Nazis chose in terms of putting people in the ovens. So it, 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 it can become a, a, a very difficult thing. Um, the Druze, an offshoot of Islam, are given religious freedom. 
And, and it was their choice. They were not required to serve in the army. They often did and chose to be border guards. Uh, that's changed a bit. They have a little more um, distrust of the Israeli government, but they're able to practice. Um, in general, because there, there are always going to be exceptions, but take a flashpoint of the Temple Mount, where I used to be able to go and did. I've been inside of the Dome of the Rock, something I'm not allowed to do now, according to the Muslim authority. I've been in the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which I'm not sure I would be allowed to do now. But Muslims, unless there's great unrest and there, there's danger, Muslims are allowed to practice their religion. They have access. So much access that Jews are not allowed on the Temple Mount on Fridays because it interferes with the Muslim Sabbath. So when you talk about integration of society and how are they treated and so forth, I can't, I'm not going to tell you it's perfect, but I can tell you overall that there's an attempt to live up to the basis on which Israel was founded. Um, territorial claims and so forth, that's another story. But again, I rankle at the idea that Israel is an apartheid society because in South Africa, Blacks were not allowed to be in the government. They weren't allowed to vote. There, were, there was all, all of that. And we have Arab Muslim parties represented in the Knesset. They're allowed to vote. They're allowed to be part of that process. Um, in numbers, they're a minority. And that's going to have an effect on their strength and what have you. But overall, I believe the intent is there. And I would, I, I think, um, I would much rather be an Arab Israeli citizen than be an Iranian at the moment, particularly if I wanted to be a liberal Arab. My, my critique of the Israeli government right now is if they want to turn Israel into a true theocracy, look around and find me a country where religion is the ruling entity in the country and tell me you'd want to live there because the ones that come to my mind are Saudi Arabia, Iran, Afghanistan, off the top of my head. I don't want to live in any of those countries. I want a more secular Jewish state where Jews are allowed to practice as they choose. It runs on a Jewish rhythm, but isn't controlled by the religion overall. There was a, a bumper sticker when I was in Santa Fe that said, when religion ruled the world, it was called the dark ages. There was also a bumper sticker that said, dear God, please protect me from your followers. My basic philosophy and statement is, if you are a fanatic in your religion, by definition, you have perverted the religion. And I challenge you to find me a situation where that's not the case. Folks, it's approaching nine o'clock. So, uh, Frankie, hello. And um, I think somebody else had their hand up. Would you wave at me and, and if you want to ask another question? Here I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I don't know if you're familiar with the Israel Tennis and Education Centers. Um. I hope so. <laughs> I, I, I have an odd connection. Somebody was going to make a speech in Hebrew when, when I was at HUC in LA. And they asked me to translate their speech from English into Hebrew. And I actually found that that was above my pay grade because when it came to translating the word center, I couldn't figure out what the right word was. And I had to give that to a native Hebrew speaker and the term was mitkan tennis, mitkan for center, because otherwise it was a, it was a geometry term and all sorts of things. Uh, Merkaz was what I was thinking of, but that didn't work either. So I, I, I know they exist, but I'm not familiar with them. Well, I wish you were. My father and Joe Shane created it. Wow. And, and they are centers where anybody can come the children and the parents bring their children 
They have an education library where they have to do their homework before they can go out on the tennis courts. They are given tennis rackets and balls and lessons and clothing. And so they're, it's trying to mix the Israel, the Palestinians and the Jewish people. And they had a little trouble starting it years ago. And once they would go to the mayors of the different cities and say, would you like to have this? No, 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 we don't want it. And then once they saw what it was doing, there are now 24 Israel tennis centers in Israel. And, you know, I'm very proud of my family. <laughs> and, you, um, you know, I just wish the, the, like the tour groups, they never take them to one of the centers. And therefore, a lot of people don't know about them. So they do have activities every year in the United States where they bring the children and they have tennis matches and things. And I, of course, always go to them. And, uh, you know, how do you get more people? I, I've talked to the people in Florida from the centers and said, you need to get this out to the public more. <laughs> I think you need to, to, to contact some of the Israeli tour groups and see if you get them to include it on the itinerary. That's what I suggested yeah. the Florida people do. I, I want to close tonight with a, a thought-provoking story, if you will, but on the proviso that when you hear it again from the pulpit, you won't throw stones at me. Um, this was told some decades ago when it really looked like the peace process was gaining strength. And in fact, in one of the magazines, um, the person who told the story said that the, the peace process was inevitable and there would be peace between Israel and the Palestinians. Um, and this is the story. There was a little town in Eastern Europe, probably the Ukraine, I believe, where the Jews and the peasants got along very, very well. And um, one night, it found the, the Jews and the peasants together in the local tavern drinking together, as they were prone to do from time to time. And Moisha, who was feeling probably no pain, turned to his buddy, Ivan. He said, you know, Ivan, we're better than you are. And Ivan looked at him and said, Moisha, why would you say that? And he said, because... Because, Ivan, we don't hunt. You do. I know they're Jewish hunters, but keep that aside for the moment. Uh, he said, you go out, you kill animals for sport. And we don't do that. So we're, we're better than you. And Ivan laughed at Moshe and he said, Moshe, the reason you don't hunt is because we don't allow you to carry weapons. And the next day, the entire Jewish population of that village left and went to the land of Israel because they decided they wanted to answer that question. If they were allowed to carry weapons, would they hunt? The year that I lived in Jerusalem, during that time, the Israeli army was known as a pure weapon because it was only used in self-defense. I don't think they refer to the army that way anymore. And I think we're still trying to decide if we're allowed to carry weapons, will we hunt? Um, I don't know if this particular war will answer that question or not. I only hope that the answer is even when we're allowed to carry weapons, we won't hunt, but I don't know. And I think that's enough of a thought-provoking question. If it haunts you the way it has haunted me for decades, we'll be in the same place of not sleeping well sometimes at night. Um, I thank you all for coming. I thank you for your patience. I thank you for listening to me. I hope this was informative. I hope it was thought-provoking. Um, and I hope, above all, 
that if anything, this opens some channels of communication. Nothing anybody said did I find offensive. Nothing offensive. Nothing did I find um, inappropriate. And I want you to know that the, the gates are open, the lines are open, and feel free to continue this conversation with me one-on-one -on -one or in small groups or what have you. And I, I do want to thank you all for being here, um, uh, if only from afar. Thank you, Rabbi. God bless you. And you as well, and, and all of us. Um, Oseh shalom bim ramav, ho yaaseh shalom. Aleinu, bel kol Yisrael, bel kol haolam. May the one who causes peace to reign in the high heavens cause peace to descend on us, on all Israel, and from there, on all the world. Peace is uh, the highest priority. Amen. Folks, and I wish you a good night. Amen. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you very much, Rabbi. Thank you. Thanks so much.